Romans 6, verses 17 and 18. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Throughout this new year, I guess we could still say it's a new year. We're almost, well, we're, we're past halfway through January, but with the Lord's help, I like to look as we go along throughout the year uh, at some of the core or and core Bible doctrines that are foundational to the Christian faith. And um, this morning I like to consider what the Bible says about sin. I might say as we begin, um, we know we're in, in a battle. In fact, it was mentioned in the beginning of Sunday school or the opening session and the kids sang, we all sang that were there. Uh, I may never march in the infantry, but I'm in the Lord's army. And that we are in a battle. It's a battle for truth. Um, in, in the back of the Apostolic Faith magazine, which is, has been our practice for, well, since it was first published, we, we noticed there's, 17 Bible doctrines listed. But these are not the only Bible doctrines that we believe. The Bible has a lot of teachings. In fact, uh, in, in the magazine it says a, a statement of Bible doctrine, and then it says we believe in divine inspiration of the Bible and endorse all the teachings contained in it. Following is a summary of our basic doctrine. So there's 17 doctrines listed, and frankly, those 17 are some of the, the ones that are, um, well, that distinguish us from some of the organi Christian organizations today. Um, if, you follow, if you read church history and you follow, even read about the Great Awakenings and the time in the 17th century, 18th century, uh, uh, the revivals that took place, holiness was at the core uh, of, of revivals, and it always will be. Uh, and so the teachings that, that uh, by the grace of God, our church has attempted, or not just attempted, has, has held on to, and others too. Again, we're not the only ones, but, but we are concerned with knowing what the Bible says, and in fact, as I'm thinking of this year, it might be as, as we go along, if somebody was to ask you, what is, what makes, you, what, what's different about your church? What would you tell them? Well, one of the things we would say is that we still teach the Bible doctrine that God, through Jesus Christ, delivers from sin. Amen. And that's what we see in our text this morning, but, but we'll look at as, what the Bible says about sin. Sin is not a made-up word um, that re the religious world made up to make people feel guilty or judged. Sin is a Bible word. And it's necessary to understand what the Bible says about sin. And we'll go deeper into this, but really it's, it's necessary in order sin, to understand what sin is, and as we look at it this morning, it's necessary in order to understand who God is and who we are as human beings and, and what salvation means or how can we experience reconciliation with God. Today, in our world, we know it's considered unloving or offensive to tell people uh, that they're sinners. I guess that may have been offensive for generations, actually. Um, but the Bible tells us we're all born in sin, shaping in iniquity. You know, but we, we do ask. We want to remind ourselves, and we could ask, uh, is it more loving to not tell people the truth about what the Bible says? 
Is it more, uh, and I think of the illustration of cancer as a form, um, we know all diseases are a product of, a result of sin, but cancer being, uh, as a general rule, an incurable disease without God's intervention, some, some can be treated, but, but do you want to go to a doctor and if you have, and he sees your diagnosis as cancer, do you want him to tell you the truth or you want her to tell you the truth? Or do you want them to be nice? Do you want them to be nice to you and, and not tell you your real condition? No, you you want them to tell tell us that condition. We want them to tell us what is our real disease or illness, and find the treatment or the healing for it. So, sin must be accurately um, diagnosed in order to be treated. We want to be reminded, of course. Um, and certainly want everyone to know that one sin can keep us out of heaven. One sin separated man, humanity from God. If it's not repented of, it will separate us from God for eternity. Um, some try to minimize the sinfulness of sin. Very much so in our day and age. Um, others try to minimize the destructive nature of sin. Others attempt to deny the existence of sin altogether. But really, it's hard to deny the existence of sin when we look into our present world. Sin is all around us. News constantly reminds us of the evil that exists in our world. Uh, it's so disturbing when we learn of such gross and unimaginable evil that a human being can do to another human being. Um, when we think of sin and what the Bible says and what we've witnessed, we could certainly say that we've witnessed people that were in chains or enslaved by sin, and then through an, an experience of salvation, they were delivered from sin. So they were, there was a miracle that took place in the heart, and they were change. So we've witnessed a change from, from somebody that was living in a life of sin, of rebellion and disobedience towards God, to a life of righteousness and holiness. We've also, it's sad and heartbreaking to watch, and obviously even more heartbreaking to God, but we've also witnessed times where people have experienced, tasted of the goodness of God, and walked right, lived right, and then turned away from God, and back into a life of outbroken sin. So, while some may try to um, deny the existence of sin, it's hard when you look around to not notice it. The Bible teaches we are all free moral agents with responsibility for our own actions. Ezekiel 18.4 says, Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. And notice, he says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. In other words, we all are accountable individually to God. The Father is a, uh, held accountable for his actions, as is the Son when he comes to that age of accountability or daughter. We are account accountable and we stand before God individually, not as a husband and wife even. What we believe, we know, and we see it through Paul's teachings, informs how we behave. And notice, in fact, notice in our text, he says, ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed the, from the heart the form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. You heard a teaching, uh, you heard us preach a doctrine or a teaching, he says to the, the, those in Rome. And because you embraced, you believed and obeyed from the heart, you were delivered. In fact, that's uh, in, in our text, that's what we see, but it's also Ro uh, Romans 6 through 8, Paul's beautifully describing, outlining how the gospel or the gospel of Jesus Christ or of grace frees us from the bondage of sin and empowers us to live righteously. We still teach by the help of the Lord that, that the grace of God breaks the chains of sin. We're talking about the battle for truth. And, and recently I, I heard and looked it up and 
notice that um, Charles Spurgeon is quoted for, with saying, discernment is not being able to tell right from wrong. But he says, discernment is being able to tell right from almost right. And I think in the day and age we live in especially, uh, uh, we have to be discerning of what is right and what is almost right. And really, it's not just in our day and age. It's one of the, it's, it is the oldest trick of the devil. From the very beginning, Satan tempted man by questioning the, the, the seriousness or the severity, the, the, the real nature of sin when he said, ye shall not surely die. Surely it's not that harmful. So, what we believe about sin will inform our entire theology. You know, so I was thinking, where do we start? Um, as we consider core doctrines, you, we want to form our faith on the Bible. People today, uh, it seems, uh, through some surveys here and there, that people don't, Christians, that, that, that um, claim to be Christians, or they may be indeed, but people don't seem to read the Bible as they once did. We want to be students of the Bible. We want to study what the Word says, and we want to form our faith on biblical truth. So you go home and study sin in the Bible, uh, 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 what, what the Bible says about sin. It's mentioned hundreds of times. Uh, don't settle for what the preacher says. Really, we're only scratching the surface this morning. It is critical that we have a proper understanding of what sin is, how it acts, how it affects humanity, how it affects our relationship with God, what it means when God provided a remedy. You know, as I thought about this, all the understanding of other biblical do doctrines, we have to have a proper understanding of what sin is in order to have a proper understanding of many of the other doctrines. For instance, the, our proper understanding of what sin is, according to the Bible, helps uh, informs how we our understanding of the nature of God, the nature of man, freedom and uh, freedom of the human will, uh, human responsibility and accountability to God, God's plan for redemption, God's provision or remedy, uh, the atonement or the blood of Jesus. Why did Jesus have to die? Our understanding of righteousness and holiness is, is based on, uh, on our understanding of sin. If we, if we have an inc incorrect or almost right understanding of what sin is, then our understanding of righteousness will also be warped if we start off with an understanding uh, that, that sin... For instance, I'll give you this example. Does grace change us? Or does, does grace change the nature of sin? In other words, the, does Calvary provide for us so we take the, drink this potion that from now on, no matter how much sin we commit, we're, we're free forever? No. The grace transforms us. So grace transforms the human nature, not the nature of sin. Sin remains sinful. Sin remains, remains le eternally lethal. So our understanding of righteousness, holiness, of grace, of faith, of repentance. Why is there a need for repentance? We, that's a subject within itself. Salvation, forgiveness, justification, entire sanctification. If we don't have a proper understanding of sin, then we don't understand why we need to be saved and sanctified. True worship. If, uh, if we have a proper understanding of sin and, and that sin separates us from God and, and that, that, that to obey is better than sacrifice, in fact, one of the Proverbs says that the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. So we could bring all our offerings to God, and if we're wicked, 
It's spitting in God's face. Say it lightly. Our understanding of what it means to be faithful to God. Temptation, backsliding, the eternal destiny of man. All of these are rooted or interconnected with our understanding what, uh, what sin is. So, again, one of the oldest tricks of the devil is to, to deceive humanity regarding the destructive nature of sin. So, the nature of sin. Sin is not harmless, but it's rather very destructive. The world celebrates. We live in a world that celebrates sin. It glorifies it. It, it says this is what everybody should be doing. It calls evil good and good evil. For years now, preachers or popular preacher personalities, we should say, have unashamedly, you could see it online, they boast about the fact that they don't preach in their church about sin. And they tell you it's because they don't want to make people feel guilty or ashamed or discouraged. And so they choose to give an uplifting message. The uplifting message is that Jesus delivers us from sin. He provides a cure that we might be reconciled with God and experience intimacy with God. And in order to have a right relationship with God, we must deal with sin. That's what the Bible teaches. Church is not supposed to be a center of entertainment, right? True Christianity is not simply a therapeutic, meaning it makes us feel good temporarily. Church, the house of the Lord, we pray it's a healing station for our soul. It's where sinners come and meet Jesus and experience healing. So what is sin? Who defines sin? God defines sin. He defines it in his word. In Romans 7, 7, Paul wrote, What shall we say then? Is, is the law sin? God forbid. And then he says, nay, I have not known sin. I wouldn't have known what sin is, Paul says, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. So the law shows us what, what God's nature is, and God shows us what he commands us in order to be in a right relationship with him. And the law reveals to us God's holy standard. And the, God, the, the law also revealed to us our failure, our inability to measure up to it. The law showed us and shows us that we need a savior. The law is like a mirror. It reveals exactly where we are. It reveals God's nature and it reveals our nature. So God's holy word teaches us what sin is. God's word shows us what we need to know about how to be reconciled to him. The topic of sin I mentioned is, is addressed throughout the Bible. I mentioned hundreds of times, starting with the original sin in, in Genesis, where Adam and Eve rebelled against God. They deliberately chose to do wrong. And because they chose they were informed they were created with the holy nature in the image of god innocent holy but they had the power to choose and they chose deliberately chose to rebel against god's will which is what god is uh, what, what sin is so as a result their nature was corrupted sin a choice uh, in Adam and Eve's case, the first parents corrupted their nature and their moral nature and also every, and then uh, corrupt moral nature is passed on to all humanity. So we see in scripture that, that sin is a condition and also a choice. Yes? The Bible makes a clear distinction between those two. We see that we're sinners by birth. Psalm 51, 5 says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. But also we're sinners by choice. At some point, we assert or usurp our authority over God. 
We decide. So Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned or committed sin and come short of the glory of God. We see in chapter 7 of Romans that sin is described as an oppressive governor. Sin is not harmless. Sin is not something we want to take lightly. We see it as a condition or a nature or, or uh, it's in chapter 7, verse 14 and 15. We see it as a domineering tyrant that enslaves its subject. So we see, uh, Paul wrote, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Or I'm enslaved to sin. I'm, I'm enslaved to this tyrant. Then he says, For that which I do I allow not, for what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. I want to do right, but there's something in me. There's a condition that won't let me do right. And he con concludes that uh, chapter, Who shall deliver me? Who's going to deliver me from this body of death? And he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. So we see, if we even uh, the whole chapter 6, which we read part of in our scripture reading, that Paul's contrasting being living in, in grace versus in sin. And he says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid! And then he contrasts being a slave to sin and a servant of God. And we see in verse 20 through 23 that being a servant of sin produces fruit. So that, that nature produces fruit. So notice in verse 20, chapter 6, for when ye were servants of sin, when you were, that's what and even in our text, notice he contrasts what you were and what you are. So he said, when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness, or you were without righteousness. And notice verse 21, what fruit had ye then in those things where ye are now ashamed? The fruit of that condition of being in, enslaved to sin, you, uh, cause, you, 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 it caused behavior or deeds that you were ashamed of. And ultimately, the end of those things is death. So he says, but when you were... But now in verse 22, he says, But now, being made free from sin, or having been made free, delivered from sin, ye become servants to God, and ye have fruit unto holiness. Verse 23, again, contrasting, he says, The wage of the sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So sin is a real condition, a spiritual condition. We see in Scripture, that ruins lives. I don't have to convince you of that, do I? No, I don't think so. It promises pleasure, but that pleasure is short-lived. And instead, sin brings shame, misery, pain, and ultimately death. The Bible, as I mentioned, uh, mentions the word sin um, hundreds of times. So to have a biblical definition of what sin is, we need to study and see where the, the multiple uh, usage, uh, uh, uses or the usage of that word, sin, and, and allow s Scripture to interpret Scripture. For instance, you might hear somebody say this very loose de definition of sin. Sin is missing the mark, as if, if you're taking the bow and arrow and you aim for a target, you miss the mark. Sin is much more than missing the mark. 1 John 3, 4 uh, uh, mentioned that sin is a transgression of the law. Genesis 4, 17, uh, excuse me, James 4, 17 says, To him that knoweth to do good and doeth not to him it is sin. In Genesis 4, 7, which is the first time I believe the word sin actually is used, uh, translated as sin, means an offense. Um, in Romans 3, verse 9 and you can look these up later if you want, but both uh, Paul mentioned that both Jews and Gentiles are all under sin. In fact, the word that, again, some will use just the definition of missing the mark. The original word, Greek, is harmatia. And we see here in, in chapter 3, verse 9 of Romans, Paul uses that word, and it does mean miss the mark, but, but he's saying both Jews and Gentiles are all under sin. So he's speaking of a condition that, that is uh, um, 
that refuses to worship God, uh, th- it's a condition that implies acts of sin. Asebia is another Greek word which is translated as ungodliness. And again, I'm not going to give you a thorough study, but this word means to a refusal to worship God. Another word uh, means going aside, but it, it speaks of a definite breach or transgression. When somebody breaks the law intentionally. Other words for sin are translated as or described being an unpersuadable or refusal to hear. Lawlessness and unbelief. So if we were to take just, and again I, I would challenge you, you study these words and see how the Bible uh, interprets uh, itself. But a thorough study of the word sin brings us to conclude that sin is both a willful, defiant act that transgresses God's law, but it, and also it's an underlying condition, condition that, that opposes itself to divine law. It's a defiant act against God, and it's also a condition. Sin is not an accident, in other words. An act of sin is not an accident in Scripture. Sin is making an informed decision. Sin is willful transgression or breaking the law. Sin is willful defiance. It's asserting our will against God's will. It's knowing, it's an informed decision, knowing that if I do this, I break God's law. And if I break God's law, I'm separating myself from him. But I'm going to do it anyway. That's what sin is. To backslide, backslide is to know that if you're committing this act, you're separating yourself from God, and you say, I don't care, I'm doing it anyway. I want my way, then God's way. That's what Adam and Eve did. So the Bible lists many um, words, specific deeds as, as sinful. And you could study that. Adultery, fornication, murder, thievery, greed, deceit, just, uh, a lust, envy, blasphemy, pride, homosexuality, m- malice, backbiting, spite, lying, disobedience, unbelief, hypocrisy, rebellion, lack of mercy, vengeance, immorality, impurity, indecency, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, hostility, heresy. But here's the thing, and I say, you know, you could st- there's much more specific words listed. And by the way, just to, when in Galatians 5, when Paul's describing the works of the flesh, he concludes with a warning. He says, Of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Here's, here's the concern as we wind down on Uh, And again, we're just scratching the surface. We want to be concerned with what sin is because they which do such things, unless we repent of our sins and live by the grace of God right, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Sin is exceedingly sinful. It's destructive. Eternally lethal, I mentioned. And the problem is we need discernment because in our day and age, Definitions are being changed. Terms are being redefined. I'll just give you a sample. So we need to understand, just because society, or even in religious circles, the, the words are, are changing. Why? It's the same trick that the devil used on Adam and Eve, is to take away the destructive nature of sin. He shall not surely die. So here's an, a few examples. It's no longer adultery. It's just an affair. That, that sounds... A little harmless, right? No, it's not harmless, but it's no longer fornication. It's just sleeping together. It's no no longer sexual sin. It's just an alternative lifestyle. It's no longer committing adultery in the heart. It's just looking at pornography. It's no no longer idolatry. It's just harmless entertainment. It's no longer committing blasphemy or taking the Lord's name in vain. It's just slang. Everybody uses that word. Oh, and substitute for, you know, do you, how would you like it if, God, if people used your name when they got mad or when they're shocked? 
but they use Jesus' name, they use God's name. No, it's not slang. It may be in our culture, but I don't want to take God's holy name lightly. I want to cherish it. It's no longer, or it's not murdering a child in the womb. It's just abortion. It's sanitized, or it's pro-choice. See, see how our society sanitizes, uh, sanitizes these words that are sin in the Bible. Again, it's, it's danger, uh, dangerous to call sin a mistake, and it's also destructive to call a mistake sin. There is a difference between a willful rebellion against God versus our humanity, which uh, are in our human uh, frailty as a result of the fall. Sometimes we may not have perfect, un- we don't have perfect understanding. Our intentions are pure. But we might say sometimes something that hurts someone. But a, a heart that is right turns around and says, when you learn that you've hurt someone, a heart that is holy says, I'm sorry, forgive me. And we have to go back to God. Sometimes God in his love and mercy and grace will reveal to us, you crossed the line, you, you did something that grieved me. And a heart that doesn't want to do that, a heart that is right says, I'm sorry, forgive me. There's a difference between sin and and an an infirmity that is, an infirmity is a result of our humanity that needs God's grace and forgiveness and also needs our cooperation to say, Lord, from now on, I'm going to do better. So there's a difference between sin and mistake. But we dare not label everything a mistake to to continue to roll into or trample on God's will and call it just a a mistake or it's just me. No, no. We want to live right, and the grace of God frees us and gives us the fruit of righteousness. So, we just looked at the problem this morning, which is sin, but there's a remedy. And we won't study it this morning, but the remedy is Jesus Christ. One last scripture, Matthew 121, uh, which we often read during uh, Christmas time. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus saves. There's power to save. Thank God for the doctrine that we have been taught. We want to teach it to our children. Just like the Roman, the people in Rome heard the doctrine, and they believed it from the heart, and they were freed from sin. We've experienced it too. And by the grace of God, we want to walk in righteousness. Thank God for the remedy this morning. We want to uh, be reminded and cherish the truth and guard it. And if you're not saved this morning, I know it's not pleasant to hear that you're a sinner. But we all heard that message. That's the Bible message. But the, the answer is Jesus. He came to save us. Thank God for his love that reaches out this morning to every soul. We'll sing 118. Make peace with God if you're not right with God. And praise God for the victory that he offers through Jesus.